Let's say uh, thank you for having me. Um, to try also, especially to Tao. Um, it's sad to not see you, but then it's important to know that, like in Europe, it's um, that time of day where I can actually have a beer, um, which you can't yet. So, to you, Tao, and to the church. Um, I want to talk about, like, you know, well, physics had hangout at Hadron Colliders, I think was the title, which I'm going to abuse to um, tell you about something that, that I think um, is particularly nice. And that is, wait, I need to go to the pointer kind of thing. Okay. And this is um, about, about machine learning and um, especially about a new set of machine learning tools that um, are called generated networks that um, we have just started playing with in theory in an experiment. So let me start with like, you know, the history they come from um, or where like, you know, other applications. And my like favorite one is of course, um, generating art with a network that's called the Gangok network. And um, people have tried to use machine learning for generating art, pieces of art for, for a while. Um, you all know that, look, you can turn like a picture into like a painting in the style of whatever, Picasso or Van Gogh. Um, the question here in this special project was, can you create new pieces of art? So can I train the network on art and then generate new pieces of art? Um, for example, in our case, you train on 80,000 pictures, different, like, you know, organized by style and on, by genre. And you train a network that maps a noise vector. So, like, you know, um, a, a vector of, like, you know, um, random numbers um, to actually generate these images. And then you do that, and you see here, um, you see a bunch of um, flowers that were generated that way. And um, that was one of the genres um, considered in this, in this um, program. And the other one is a portrait, you see. Port set of portraits here. And the most famous one, one I guess, is Edmond de, Edmond de Bellamy. Um, this is from um, 2017, also, like, I think, um, which was a picture generated by a, a generative network, trained on 15,000 portraits. So like, you know, same order of magnitude as we saw before, sold for 432,500 bucks. So um, for sure, there's something we can learn about um, from, from the arts, arts scene, namely, how you sell these kind of things. Um, the picture isn't even particularly, <laughs> um, well, I don't know. Um, um, but if you look, by the way, here, down, down here, this is the loss function so, um, of the, the artist. The loss function, I should say, is um, the thing that like, you know, is, is, it sits at the basis of all machine learning always is like, you know, the loss function, this thing that we minimize to define however, like, you know, whatever our network learns. Let me just briefly, very, very briefly, like describe what a generative network or special, um, again, algorithm looks like. And I'm just using like the example that I'm come to, this is like, you know, generate events at the LHC, but it could be VDNE, really any, anything. So you have a training set, which I would call it like the, the true events, XT, and they follow a probability distribution in like, you know, some phase space. Um, okay, and this is the input here. Um, and then you have the output, and that is would be generated events where you map a random number vector here onto a set of generated events. So this is those generated events. And they follow an output distribution PG, and you want those to be, to be as similar as possible. Um, the, um, the specific structure of the GAN is that you have two different um, networks really playing against each other. One is constructing a discriminator, which is essentially a network trying to distinguish the training data from whatever the generator gives it. So it is, it, it's, a, it, it's a, um, a construction of D of X, which is either one or zero or in between, depending on if the net, uh, image looks true or generated. And then you have a generator and they play against each other. The generator is trying to fool the discriminator. The discriminator is gonna catch the generator. And eventually the whole idea is that this thing um, stabilizes into, into um, a combined network. And then you can use the generator to generate stuff that is indeed indistinguishable by the discriminator from the original training data. So what you get this way is you get a statistical, statistically independent copy of your training events. So you map all the structures of your training events um, onto, into your network and then you generate events and they should contain the same information as your training events, except now they're statistically independent. So we're generating events which are, have a known structure, but they're new. Um, at the LHC, we have seen since about 2017 a few like set like you know applications of the, the generative networks. Early ones were um, um, Monte Carlo in uh, integrator integrators. Um, ben David's paper, like you know, the first one um, 
this one here, Klimek and Perlstein is like not really a generative network, but nevertheless should be mentioned here. And then we have um, GAN studies. I um, I'll, I'll talk about a few of them now in my talk. They generate jets or jet images, or they generate a detector simulation, or they generate LHC events, or they generate like, you know, unfold. I'm going to talk about that in a minute as well. Um, QCD factorization, EFT models, or event subtraction. I have like, you know, in blue, I marked the um, applications that I'll talk about in a little bit. What's I think uh, important to mention is that it's not just people like me playing with it, but it's also like the professionals dealing with them. And that is in that case, especially the Sherpa event generator. There's two studies from the Sherpa event generator, which use generative networks to um, improve their um, important sampling or the integrator slash generator structure. The up amusing part is that like these um, networks in Sherpa, um, they're in actually highly um, uh, the specialized invertible generative networks, which are used in Sherpa just because they work extremely well because they don't invert anything and they don't generate in anything in Sherpa, but it's, um, they're the best networks for their purpose. So it's a beautiful example how you can do these things. My first example, like in our application is, um, if you want historic or like an early application, it's about generating jets. And I decided to, to mention that because it is really exactly the same kind of network that's been used for, like as far as I can tell, that's been used for the Gangok Im images, except not jet images. So some of you or us might remember, like jet images are essentially color colorimeter heat maps pixelized in the plane by, um, as a, of the azimuthal angle versus the pseudo rapidity. So essentially you have like, you know, a detector and you're looking like, you know, outward and then like, you know, you have, you have a little like piece of the, the sky or the piece of the colorimeter and then you, um, color coded by event uh, by the by the by the um, energy deposition the technical complication as compared to like you know gangok is that these are very sparse in images so we have typically like you know all of a magnitude of thousand or so pixels in such a jet and you have like you know i don't know meaningful constituents 20 30 something like that um, the task of this early network, like, you know, by, among other people, Ben Nachman, was to reproduce first valid jet images from training data. And then just the same way they, like, categorize them in, in Gang Goch, um, it's generate jets which are organized by QCD versus WDK jets. Like, um, Jamin talked about the, like, you know, jet tagging and these kind of applications. This is, the, like, you know, a nice example how you could do that. And, like, you know, I, I'm showing here um, a little, like, a jet image on the top. And then what the comparison found out that the paper is very, very, very detailed in like, you know, trying to like, um, to explain like, you know, what the network learns, like, you know, how it can be understood, how it can be tested and so on and so forth. I'm skipping all that. It's extremely carefully done in that respect. Um, one of the examples that like, it, it gives here is, um, so uh, it's high level observables. So in that case, for example, the jet mass and how it is reproduced um, where um, the um, GAN are the solid, like in the generative network, the GAN, um, um, events, the jets are, are solid lines and um, the dashed lines are the, are the training data. And you see that they agree with each other and you see that um, the signal, which is the W jets and the background for the, Q, which is the QCD jets actually get nicely distinguished. So that works, the network works. It learns, it learns jets, W jets and QCD jets. And without you know, like, you know, going to the detail, I mean, this is in the 27 study, like, you know, seriously impressive. Um, the one thing is like, you know, this might notice, like what we have not tried is actually sell one of these like jet images for $432,000. Um, that would be nice. Um, in any case, we haven't tried, we haven't sold them. Ben hasn't sold them, um, looking for a faculty job instead. And um, the open questions that they're posing in this paper to Gens are, are like, you know, already the open questions that we are talking about now. Namely, first of all, it's obvious, what's a, what's, a, what's a cool use case? And what can we actually use this for? Like, in a way, this is like, it's a seriously nice new techniques, but, you know, it's an open question is always like, can I, can I play with that? Where can I use that? Beautiful example being Sherpa using networks um, in the integration networks, which are not meant to integrate anything. The second question here is um, that the net paper talks about quite a bit is what the uncertainty, like how do I understand the uncertainty in like, you know, in these, in, in these jets? I mean, uh, how different are they training and test sample, right? I mean, what, like, what is an uncertainty, an error bar? And the second one that I actually, as a theorist, said we always wonder when we like think talking, hearing like our experimental colleagues talking about precision physics. Okay, what's the available, the achievable precision, precision in, such a, um, in, in such an analysis? Like, you know, how precisely can these GANs um, 
actually reproduce um, whatever training data we have. Okay, um, the second application I want to show you, right? the second application I want to show you is uh, LHG events. And the paper that we wrote here um, is um, with Anja Butter and Ramon Winterhalder. It wasn't the first paper on the market. I mean, there's like a, a few studies on, on um, on, 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 on Z events, on DiJet GAN, so on and so forth, like you know, they're mentioned here um, available. What we chose is a relatively complex final state TD bar to, to six jets, which translates into eight degrees of freedom in the final state, so an 18 dimensional final state. The first lesson we learned is that don't use the 18 degrees of freedom, use 12 and set the external particles on shell. There's a technical reason for that. Networks have a very hard time learning things which in every event are always exactly the same because they like, you know, they, the, the, the discriminator and the generator work by moving around things. And so if you move around things and currently shake your, like, your little prediction, you, you have a hard time reproducing stuff very, very precisely if it's always exactly the same number, technical side remark. Okay, and then we looked like, you know, at phase-based distributions. And the first thing you look at totally flat phase-based distributions, like as a movement angle, some kind of stuff, and you find fine, no problem. Our referee insisted in that, and thank you for insisting, and we, we found no issues. The second thing is observables that like the type of the typical shape of a PT distribution, energy distribution, you have a bulk and you have a tail. So like, you know, how do these kind of observables look? And I'll show you two here, which are the tops. So for the top, you have to keep in mind that to get the top um, 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 this distributions, you need to reconstruct three final state particles to get that PT distribution right. Distribution. So this is not easy for the network. And what I show here, like this is the energy of the top of the PT of the top, and you see the typical behavior here. What you also see here is you see a little bit of a tilt here. And you see a little bit of a tilt here. This is one of the big disadvantages of these networks, namely that they sometimes generate, maybe small, but they are, there's a danger that they, sell, uh, that they generate systematic effects. Where do the systematic effects come from? Well, in our case, we at least know where the systematic undershooting here in the high PT tail comes from. And that is, there's simply no training data available there. If on that, our training data, this is the uncertainty on the, on, the, on, the, um, on the events in the training sample above this like PT cut. And you see, well, we have nothing left. We have like, you know, above 300 GeV, we have like, you know, only um, enough, enough events in the training set to, uh, to, to simulate stuff to about 20%. And well, so we generate a little bit of an uncertainty here. The danger is, though, that we are generating systematic uncertainties from the uh, statistics uncertainty, which brings me back to the original question already asked by Ben Nachman and collaborators. What about the precision? How do you understand this? To decorrelations, we learned this from the cosmologists. Um, like you can't have like you know, a talk with a without a colorful picture. So here's my colorful picture. This is a two-dimensional correlation, phase-based boundary, Jacobian peak, the entire thing works fine. Here, cut through this, like at 100 GeV, you're cutting through that works fine. Two dimensional correlations are no problem. We checked all kinds of correlations in our analysis, no, never a problem. And here, this is just an illustration. Then we improve the resolution used. So basically, we, have, we start with 1 million training events, looks like that. This is a phi on delta, the, the, the azimuth angle correlation between the two jets with, with the typical um, diagonal correlation between the two jets and the delta phi. So now you generate events, 10 million events. You generate 50 million events, and you see how the resolution gets better. At some point, you run into overtraining, and your resolution um, is going to like be limited by the fact that you might have have um, trained on on, um, on on the training data that had a statistical fluctuation. But nevertheless, it works. I think we can say. One side remark: intermediate resonances are, have always been a problem. Anybody who has ever tried to simulate TT bar, even just standard TT bar, with like you know like a phase space. Um, a generator will find that this is extremely hard because you have an intermediate top propagator, you have an intermediate double rep propagator, and for both of these particles, the width is much smaller than, 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 than the mass. So it's a very, very narrow structure, bright Wigner um, propagator. And that bright Wigner propagator typically gets mapped either by Vegas automatically or explicitly. So um, what, what happens in, with a network? Let's assume we have a one dimensional feature of some kind that could be the invariance of advance or anything like that. That or anything else, what you do is you can use an additional term of the loss function that we add to it. This is so called MMD loss. And the MMD loss is nothing but a, um, a batchwise comparison of a one dimensional or possibly two dimensional distribution. And we're like, you know, that we can add to the network. So instead of just like training the discriminator, we always train, uh, also train a second term here, the so called MMD loss. And that we combine into the generator loss function. So how well does this do? 
Well, this is an example here. Um, no MMD loss, it gets the top mass, for example, about right, but the width is, about, is wrong without MMD loss by about, about a factor two. And now you add like, you know, these losses, this is the true distribution is red, and you see that independent on what kind of kernel in this MMD loss we add, we get a significant improvement. It's not quite perfect here, we don't get the peak quite right, but if, if you look at the, at the width, we get a two out of like you know, a few percent. So phase pass structures and phase pass resolution is really not a showstopper. It requires some work, doesn't come for free, but you know Vegas also doesn't come for free, for free um, or uh, phase based or multi-channel. Just a side remark, when I, um, when we thought about these um, with, with Anna Butta and with Ramon, we, we thought about these uh, the generative networks, there was always one thing that we thought is like, you know, is, is there a nice example how we can show that a network beats the statistics of the training sample? And there is, imagine you have two samples that you want to subtract from each other. In particle physics, that's not that rare that we want to do that, like in simulation all the time. Now, the uncertainty, once you, when you bin these kind of things, you subtract them, the uncertainty on the difference of the two samples is given by the un uncertainty, the statistic uncertainty on the larger of the two original sam uh, samples. Um, so can we beat that? Um, applications for the, such a subtraction network in terms of phys physics would be like subcollinear subtraction terms, multi-jet merging, on-shell subtraction, background subtraction in analysis, for example. This is the, the, the picture of our network. It's important that we have two discriminators for the two samples, S and B, as we call them. We subtract them and we generate something that corresponds to um, B minus S. We have a couple of examples now in our paper about that. Let me like mention one of them. And one of them is imagine you have events PP to um, E plus E and two leptons to that E plus E minus, which goes through an, a photon or a Z or both um, of shell. Um, sorry for the weird notation, but this is like, you know, the way the notation came about in the, in the actual subtraction thing. So we asked the question, if I have the entire set of events, we have sets of events PP to lepton plus lepton minus, including all intermediate states, I want to extract the Z by subtracting out the photon. So I want to, strictly speaking, of, uh, extract the Z plus the interference term by taking the entire data sample and then I want to um, subtract the photon, which I can simulate extra. Um, and then my result should generate a Z pole, the Z pole. And you see here, you, it does that. This is the, e, uh, the energy of the, of the E minus here or the PT of the E minus. And you see that my original combined sample here is this bluish curve here, we subtract the continuum background here if you want, and what, what's left is you get the nice Z shape. Same here, beautiful phase space resolution. Um, where does this come in handy though? Like the way I think, like, you know, talking to some experimentalists, where this would come in handy, imagine Higgs to four, for five, four fermions, right? You want, to, you want to study Higgs to four fermions. Normally, you subtract out the to subtract out the background events, like, you know, or try to subtract our background event from the signal, but this is always statistically. So one way, one, one, something we could do that is, you take the sample, um, Higgs to um, four leptons, include, including signal and background. Now you find a measured sample that just includes um, the background, like for example, a shifted um, control region, if you want. And then we simulate both of them, and then the network will generate, generate you as many signal Higgs to four lepton um, uh, uh, events as possible. These are not actually measured, they're, they're generated, but they include the full information on the signal in your data. All correlations, all kinematic observables, anything you want. So this would be the kind of stuff that we could think about just to play with. Um, one of the original applications, early applications, and like applications where a lot of work has gone into is detector simulation. Why is that? And I should mention there's like, you know, Atlas studies, there's CMS studies. And I'm going to like, you know, quote from Buman et al. This is like, you know, my collaborator, Gregor Kaschitzka, with a bunch of the Germans um, doing like, you know, essentially ILC. This is uh, about to come out. It's almost, almost there. I saw the draft already. I'm not an author. Um, but I should say, say like that there's a whole lot of different groups of work on that. Um, why people do that is a work on this detector simulation, because to some degree, this is the weakest link in the simulation chain. Um, it's super expensive. I mean, Geon 4 is super expensive. It's um, probably like, you know, maybe next to like, uh, aside from like N, N squared LO matrix element, it's, it's super expensive to do. So like, you know, we want to speed it up. And fast simulation is an established problem. Like ATL fast when I was young, Delft nowadays, you know, this is all fast simulation. It's a huge market. 
everybody's using it. Of course, experimentalists are not using it because they're using it right. But the real thing, but like you know, everybody else else is using it, and it's proven incredibly useful for all kinds of phenol analysis. Nowadays, every theory um, study uses stealth or something like that. And it's much more likely to be right at the end because it does that. Okay, you train on Gion 4, in this case, um, not on non data. Um, and then what these guys do is they compare a whole different um, 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 network uh, structures. So this is like the GAN, or Wasserstein GAN. I should say that their GAN is extremely naive and it doesn't work particularly well. The Wasserstein GAN is more similar to the GAN that we are using our detector in, in our event generation. So it's more it's stabilized and they have a new tool on the market. It's called a BIP AE. Um, it's a uh, uh, information bottleneck autoencoder. And um, this is the way it looks. It's not particularly simple. Um, this is like, you know, what my former, actually, my former student, Sasha Diefenbacher, came up with after playing with it for a couple of months. So like, you know, not all networks are nice and easy and simple. Sometimes they're complicated because the problem is complicated. The nice uh, result is they train on 950,000 uh, photon showers, energy 10 to 100 GeV. And the challenge is to get all the spectra right and to maintain all the correlations between everything. And this is like a hugely, a huge dimensional phase space. I forget, like, you know, thousands of dimensions. Um, and what I show you here is like, you know, their money plot. This is um, the visible cell energy. This is just, so this is just a spectrum that they get out the photon spectrum. You see the um, GAN follows like, you know, well, I mean, the, the, the Geon force gray is a little bit hard to see. It's essentially under the green curve. Um, the GAN and the W GAN actually in their case doesn't work particularly well. The BIP AE works better, where I, I, I should emphasize that it's not the BIP AE. The BIP AE also works extremely well, but this is post-processing post, post error here that works better. Their post-processing is inspired as a more systematic approach to an MMD, MMD loss, where they basically tell the network to hell get that structure right. However, don't screw up anything else. And this is essentially their post-processing that makes them, that makes their tool work extremely well. Um, this is the last, latest, as I said, in a long list of, of, of studies by, like, you know, including, like, you know, Ben Nachman's group and Martin Erdmann's group and, like, you know, the Atlas group, Ashikosh, all, like, a lot of people working on that. Okay. Um, my last seriously published, at least published, um, result I want to talk about is um, detector unfolding. Um, it was mentioned already in some of the questions earlier today, and it's, it, is, it is a problem um, right now. As just like the, 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 the low hanging fruits from LHG physics, they're all gone. So like, you know, what do we do? We, we measure stuff with extremely high precision. And then it's not that like, you know, now, like we know my generation, we knew all, all, all knew it was SPS1A was the SUSY parameter point that like, you know, every thought, everybody thought was extremely cool and also true. And it's not, um, and, and we have no idea in theory um, what these, um, what these, uh, what's, what, what's actually hiding in the data beyond the standard model. We hope there is something interesting. And this is a problem for communicating results because we, don't, we can't, like, you know, we, we are communicating limits on models. And every theorist, of course, has another favorite model. And you cannot experimentally publish plots special handmade for every theorist on Earth. So that doesn't work. So we need some out standardized output. Um, and one of the ways of doing that, like, you know, make a general, as general as possible is, like, you know, go back to like, you know, part on level, like get rid of as much experimental complication as possible, and then communicate the results in a way that an, a theorist with math graph can just play with their models, check, compare, reproduce, right? Um, this is the idea behind unfolding data to part on level, or at least to unfold, like remove the detector effects. At the end of the day, so those of us like, you know, remember the Tevatron physics, like, you know, um, at the end of the day, then there will be the matrix only method. Matrix only method is like the best possible use of all available information by um, extracting like from an event, the, the, the probabilities that they, um, it comes from a certain hard process. Um, that's a physics application. Technically, you notice that I'm always like, you know, doing the technical, technical versus, versus, versus physics. Um, technically, what drives me here is in particle physics, we use Markov processes. We do um, a Monte Carlo generation all the time, all over the place. And in principle, this is invertible statistically. And we know this under certain hypotheses, but in practice it's not. So this is my GAN task. Partons um, um, get folded to detector level by Delft. Delft is like, you know, just another um, um, a Monte Carlo process and then inverted using GANs. Okay. 
process we chose was ZW production broad jet jet mass peak, a narrow lepton lepton mass, mass peak. We have a modified 222 uh, kinematics, so like it's very realistic, and we use the same GAN, uh, the same GAN that like we always, we always use. Um, and there's, I, I should say, there like there's a, a nice paper by Data and friends who actually su suggested this. This wasn't uh, this wasn't our idea. And there's a problem when you do that, and that is if the test data and the training data is not perfectly the same. Like for example, you train on a full data set here, and the test data is um, is a subset of the data after kinematic cuts. Then you see that the truth information, for example, here, um, and the GAN information, um, get um, get mistaken. You see that here, right? So here you see this is the the, the truth, and then you see the GAN after equation seven and eight. So it doesn't work particularly well. It gets mis 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 misled. Um, th this has to do with the structure of the network. The structure just maps one event on, onto the other. And if the two uh, data samples, one of them by reality, by like in the test data slightly shifted, then it does that mapping doesn't work anymore. However, there is a tool. You talk to your like local machine learning guys, in our case, like, you know, the imaging guys, and they say like, yeah, but you need a conditional GAN for that. The conditional GAN is a generative network that does one thing slightly different. It again maps random numbers here through the generator, like, you know, and um, on the particle level, um, and, 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 and on the parton level events, but the detector level events are taken as a condition, as a condition that stays. So you have pairs of parton level and detector level, and then you generate like, you know, events which all see the same detector level and then generate, um, generate uh, parton level um, events. And then you get the statistical generative aspect into it. Okay. Full inversion. If you look at the if you look at the distributions, looks all fine. We are good to like you know. Aside from the phase space boundaries here, we're good to I don't know what two percent or five percent doesn't matter. You see here, you can actually take um, the truth distribution in MJJ of those two jets. You can apply DELF and we can reconstruct reconstruct the original mass peak. All fine. Do that in the presence of 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 cuts. Again, this is like you know. The two, like you know, two distributions after harsh cuts, GAN, GAN events, truth events, perfectly the same. So it works. So that the whole lesson to take home is sometimes there's problems with the with the, with the with the simple generative networks, but we can circumvent them by making a better network. And talking to network people helps there. Just like one thing that was suggested by Ben is okay. Now, guys, if you can do that, what happens if you train on some model and then your test data? has a mass peak, like for example, W prime in the S channel. Your, um, so any guesses what's coming up? Well, I wouldn't show it to you if, it, it, if we, our network had screwed it up. So this is now injected data where 10% of the events all of a sudden come from a W prime that was not present in the training data. And this is the invariant mass of the four point of state particles. This is where the W prime should sit. And lo and behold, truth indeed has that peak. And now you look at the GAND events and it gets the same peak. It doesn't get the width right, but it gets the mass of the W prime right, and you know what to look. So um, BSM injection works perfectly fine. Or in other words, in the, in the, in the language of these people um, who, does the, who do this professionally, the model dependence is reduced. And here's just to flip my last sign because before Mark cuts me off. You know, you can, people can just cut you off, bam, and then you like, you know, the mic is out and then whatever. Um, but and so um, the last thing is, imagine you have a, Detector that's just a calorimeter, and then your tracker dies, and but you don't want to admit that. Um, so the question is, can I train a network to basically take calorimeter image images for QCD jets, kind of learn how QCD jets look in calorimeters, and then generate these calorimeter images at the tracking level, and they look like exactly the same way that a tracker would would, would find uh, would, would look at them. So you basically take a high resolution calorimeter image, you downsample to one eighth of the one dimensional resolution, so like almost a factor of ten in one direction, a factor of hundred in, in two dimensions, and then we, we invert this. We, we take train 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 again to reproduce the old tracking output. You think that's impossible? It must be impossible. I like this. Here's the answer. Uh, the paper isn't out, it's together with, uh, with, 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 with Daniel Weitz and the Irvine group. Um, here you see some like, you know, um, um, energy of the constituents number 1, 10, and 30 of like, you know, of our, of our jets. Um, the model prediction is blue. Um, the green one here is what happens when we downsample. The orange one is what our network gives us back. So tell me that that, that doesn't work. Experimentalists, why do you need a tracker again? Okay. <laughs> 
Cheers. Uh, my last slide is a summary, but we can as well skip it. Um, the only thing I want to say is um, generative networks are extremely cool. Um, by the way, I should say everything I'm writing here, like I'm saying here, is, there is uh, the reasons why I'm giving this talk is I'm just writing a little, a very, very brief, brief review on that one. Uh, they work on interpolation structures, latent-based structures, and you can. The nice thing is you can train them on anything you want: Monte Carlo data, any comp uh, com uh, a combination of the two. Open questions from the very beginning, from the first paper by Nachman till today's paper is: what have, What's with the uncertainties? What about possible precision? Um, I don't know the answer yet. Uh, we have to sit down and do that together. Thank you. Thank you, Tomit. Um, we have two questions so far. First question on page 17, maybe I misunderstood the points, but you mentioned that event subtraction is subject to some statistics issue in error propagation. How does machine learning get rid of this? Um, in that case, um, it gets rid of it. So the way that the, the, the statistics gets beaten by, and I know this, the way that this is uh, statistics limited is if you think about it's a binning. Um, it's not statistics limited in the general phase space. It's, it's statistics, statistics limited by the binning. In our case, the network doesn't bin, it interpolates. So it interpolates the two distributions and then generates a, um, a, 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 distant, a difference of the two interpolated um, um, in the um, distributions, and that beats the statistics of the standard binning method, technically speaking. Okay. The next question. Assuming that you use mostly computer vision type algorithms, as with GANGO, which you described, would it be possible to try others like reinforcement learning to help with the regions of face space where the training data is not available for supervised learning training? <laughs> what should I say? Yes. So the one thing I should say, a nice example, top taken comparison, we all started with jet images. What beats the crap out of all of us is the CMS study with using point clouds. And, 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 and um, so in other words, um, image recognition is probably not the last answer. It's probably not the final answer. Yes, if you find a nice uh, application to, to those um, the, using um, the other networks, um, they exist. Um, you find them, yes, always yes. Try new stuff. Um, if it's not the problem that you thought about that you solved with them, like you work with them and you find another problem that you solved with them then. Okay, and the last question, is there a rule of thumb for the number of GAN events you can generate for a given number of real events before you run into overtraining problems? That is an absolutely excellent question. We are working on this right now. We have, so what we see here, like we don't have a scientific study. So what we find here is 1 million true events 10 million generated events, 50 million generated events looks reasonable, uh, much above this in this specific network, I'd say probably not. So, but I don't know. We, ha we have no scientific answer to this. We have a little bit of experience where it says a good factor 10 is always possible, but I can't tell you what the actual scientific answer to that is.